start with? We got Greenpeace, we got the Green People, we got religion. I wish we had uh, Xavier for religion. <laughs> for religion and the Green movements. <laughs> So we, we got the, the we got the reverse racism, or under under racism racism. Where is that? Uh, towards the bottom. We yeah, have the birther is. movement coming back. What is that? Oh, oh Obama. Yeah. I stuck it in here because I know Republicans are like. I'm like, it proves he's not the president. I'm like, he didn't prove damn shit. He just poured gasoline on a fire that got out. <laughs> All right, this this looks interesting. Chevy Volt production suspended due to lack of demand. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's basically the Chevy Volts aren't selling. <laughs> so. What about the, what about the, the other one? The uh, no, they're doing the same thing. They're, they're having to, you know, cr uh, crank off a little. I don't think they fully stopped production, but the demand is being a little underwhelming for them. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know if this is people don't care about quote-unquote green cars, because I have a hard time calling these vehicles green yeah. Because they're not actually green. They're a bait and switch. I'm trading. Even if you believe in the whole CO2 thing, you know, the CO, the electricity is produced by something that makes more CO2 than the gasoline would have. Yeah. So, and at a higher cost to operate, and you get the. You have to replace the batteries to keep it going, and. and uh, it, I, I, I don't know. They're neither green economically nor green environmentally, even if you believe in the whole CO2-ness. So, yeah, let me get the mouse off of you. But it, it's, uh, for the Volt, it's not selling well. It, it's, I mean, there, there are people who have bought Volts, but they're so underselling that... Uh, Chevy has completely stopped their production line on them because they're not even sure they're going to sell the ones they've already made for this year. So there's no reason to keep making more when they don't even know if they're going to sell these. Government's response to that is they're going to provide a tax incentive to buy them. Uh, I think it's supposed to be $10,000, but that's a tax credit. So it, that's not necessarily ten thousand dollars in your pocket. That it, it's. I I mean, do you think that? What, what do you think on this? You, you think it's you think it's the economy? You think it's people are are just don't want to buy green car uh, green cars? You, you think it's a combination of all of the above? Well, I think that. It could be. It Go ahead. Uh, so you know, I would. I remember hearing that when, like, the original electric car, which was what my GM or whatever, and that that. Well, you're, you're talking about the last one GM, quote unquote, killed. Yeah. Because the original electric car was way way back before we had gasoline cars. In fact, Porsche originally wanted to be a high performance electric company. <laughs> Um, I heard that that sold well. Is that true? Well, um, that's a bit of a misnomer. They never actually sold the EV. They leased it. Which means everybody who was driving an EV never owned it. It was owned by GM the whole time, and they were on a lease. It's the same thing as those hydrogen fuel cell cars that Honda's making that are available really only in California in the United States. You know the one I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, it's like basically you're you're leasing it. It's an open-ended lease, but they reserve the right to terminate it anytime they want. And it honestly wouldn't surprise me if 
Honda terminates the lease on those things too because of how much platinum's in them. I mean, they cost a hundred thousand dollars to make. They're not exactly making money off of those. Okay, you're talking to somebody. <laughs> what? Talk, you, you, you were like talking, but I couldn't hear a word you said. Oh, oh, sorry. I was, I was. Okay. Anyway. Uh, Yeah, he's like, I'm, I'm below camera, no, I'm not. <laughs> so I'm on camera, I forgot about that. Anyway, okay, so, yeah. You know, well, we do have that problem with, you know, the, the coal-powered energy. Uh, I think that it's more important that we switch to uh, cleaner energy. And... Even if you're not, even if you don't believe in global warming, you ought to believe in switching to a renewable energy source. If it's actually renewable. Well, <laughs> solar power and stuff like that, which is pretty darn renewable. It's renewable, but um, how do we store the power? Yeah, that, that is, um, you know, batteries. Bad, you know, batteries cause a lot of uh, problems. Oops. And we're now in disco. <laughs> Apparently, my voice sounds like claps. Okay. Are you, are you talking about the problem that batteries cause? Yeah. Well, they. I mean, they don't last indefinitely. Now, if we can ever figure out how to make a bioregenerative battery, which there are people working on. They're, they're working on basically creating a, a battery that instead of being uh, alchemical in nature, it's uh, the, the positive and negative side of the battery are uh, microbes, you know, bacteria that grow in a charged way, which means as long as you feed it organic material to allow the bacteria to reproduce, you have a renewable battery that would work rather well uh, and would hold the charge and that's just they're basically genetically how engineered do they life charges for coal power say that again how do they hold charges for coal power or do they just run well we, we don't really here's the thing our entire electric grid electricity is one of the hardest things in the world to store which means you know it really is a scam that your power company charges you for over usage and less for under usage because the reality is the grid can handle the load the grid can handle. And it can't produce more power than it can, and if it's using less power than it's capable of producing, they either have to turn part of the grid off to keep from overloading it, or they have to just discharge the excess energy somewhere because they can't really store it. That's why you have all those transformers and relay stations all over town. It's what they're doing. They're load balancing based on usage because we really can't store electricity. Uh, and if you have too much or too little, you short the whole thing out. So um, the problem you get with solar is, you know, parts of the day are more sunny, less sunny. At night, you only have the moon and the stars, which means the power load is very uneven. So you're using capacitors and batteries to balance out the load uh, between high times and low times, and you're, you're trying to do something we have never managed to do as a society, which is efficiently store electricity for a later time. <laughs> I, I mean, we, we managed to do it to a degree with capacitors and batteries, but at the end of the day, it's, it's still a very inefficient process. You just use the electricity now. <laughs> I have electricity. Use it now. <laughs> um, I mean, one of the systems... Go ahead. How far can electricity travel without losing significant charge? Define significant. I mean, in a... In a, in a without losing maybe 50%. Uh, it depends on the resistance. I forget the distance over copper wire. Uh, and honestly, you can cheat. You know, with... Uh, it, it, it has to do with the... Um, it's been a while since I've taken basic electrical engineering. It, um, your resistance and your ohms, uh, it, it just it varies on the material. I mean, in theory, a material like silver 
our, our gold or really anything at zero degrees Kelvin would be a perfect superconductor and you could have almost no resistance and transfer it from C well, to sine C. Well, about maybe a power line. Could, could I, for example, uh, generate tons of power in California and then have it in the next state over? As long as you're generating enough excess power to deal with the loss due to resistance, yes. Okay, how much loss is that? Oh, that's what I'm saying. Like, it, 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 it varies on many factors. I honestly don't know the scales off the top of my head. Uh, it also varies with what power you're trying to get out the other side, whether it's 240, 120, what amperage you need. It, it's, there's a lot of factors that vary in that. Uh, real, I mean, I, I, I am trying to remember, I think our standard grid's actually a million volt grid at very low amps, and that's why we have those transponder uh, sizes. What we basically do is switch that over to the 240, 120 at higher ampage. So that there are ways through electrical engineering to turn one into the other. Yeah. And it's, it's an inefficient process, but at the end of the day, it, it's... Uh, actually, at that particular stage, doing it at that location, it's a very efficient process. So it's just you can coil one up to the other and, and down, and so on and so forth. So as long as you have power there, you can convert it up or down with the proper equipment. I'm thinking about what power is constant that is referred to as natural and renewable. You know, dams are constant. However, they're not exactly good for the environment, as we know. The only other one I know of off the top of my head are it, it is fairly constant, but it has questionable environmental issues, and that's geothermal. Yeah, I've heard about that being problematic. Well, the, the, okay. There's there's two types of geothermal. One's actually very it, very useful, but it's like a dam. It, it's it's freeing trapped pockets of water vapor and steam that are deep in the crust where they're they're vaporized. So, it, it's like putting a teapot a teapot on the stove without a pressure release valve. It's suddenly opening the pressure release valve. As long as there's pressure in there, you're going to get a lot of energy out of that. But eventually, that well runs dry. It's like tapping anything. The alternative one is creating pockets like that artificially by pumping water down from ground level into uh, the deep crust. That one is a little problematic because it has seismic implications for obvious reasons. But, the, it, it, you know, it's Boyle's Law 101. The Earth is more or less a constant temperature down there because of the pressure, which means you know, how much energy do you need? Okay, let's pump this at that pressure. It's, it, it, as long as the Earth stays hot, that'll work. And even as the Earth continues to cool, you just adjust what you're doing. As long as, you, as, long as we don't, as long as the Earth stays hot, which in theory... Well, there's something else that is relatively constant is, uh, is tide power. Uh, yeah, but that's more like wind power. It, it's, well, yeah, but wind power is, is such that it won't always... Uh, I feel that tides are more constant than wind. I've never seen the tide stop, but I've seen the wind stop. But they're not... The, okay. The, uh, um, the tide continues to go in and out because of the yeah. moon. You know, because the you know gravity, it's it's basically ellipting the earth, forcing the whole ocean to just kind of go... <laughs> which is what forms the, the tides you're thinking of. Those tides generally aren't powerful enough to get any kind of usable power out of. Uh, the ones you be a lot more energy caused by that water than would be from the wind. Uh, yes, but it's it's not a lot of power in the grand scheme of things. Where the, the however they don't they do have uh, water turbine projects. But what they're trying to do there is uh, like on the east coast of the United States. There's a number of projects trying to get approval to put turbines in the Gulf Stream. Uh, but the Gulf Stream, why it tends to be active, is not always active at the exact same level. You know, in the same way you put wind turbines in West Texas, and I, if you know anything about West Texas, you will never go out there and see every one of those turbines steel, still. 
There will always be at least a few of them spinning. The wind never fully dies down there. So it's a good place for that. But some days you'll see half of them spinning. Some days you'll see 70% of them spinning. Some days you'll see a few of them spinning. It's not the same amount of power at all times. It's much the same thing in tapping the ocean currents. There is always an ocean current, but it's not always the same magnitude in the same order, which means some days the turbine would spin this fast, other days it spin this fast, some day you get enough to get a dozen of them going, other days maybe one. And, um, I mean, putting them in the Gulf Stream is a great place to, to start that, uh, even though you're adding resistance to the Gulf Stream and slightly changing the currents of the ocean, but humans are not quite as powerful as we like to think we are. The order of magnitude change you'd make would be rather insignificant, we hope. <laughs> But, again, you'd still have the inconsistency problem. So you have to, the, basically it comes down to how do you balance the load during low performance periods to get the same power you would during high performance periods and average out the power during high performance times. It's... <laughs> okay, so what about, um, is coal renewable? Mm, well... Technically, every energy source we tap. No, well, I'm, I'm talking. There's a, there is a special definition for renewable, and it has to be like it generates within our lifetime. Yeah, coal takes about takes slightly less longer to make than oil. It's a naturally occurring fossil fuel that is created by pressure in the like earth. We're able to make coal. We pressurize natural stuff. Yeah, but it's. Yeah. A, uh, th th that's, that's like that's saying that's we can make oil synthetically, which we can, but it takes way more energy than we would ever get out of it to make it, which means if you don't have the energy in the first place to make the coal, you can't have the coal to... So, so yes, we can make it synthetically, but it's a net negative reaction in terms of energy well, release. What if, well, yeah, of course it is. You know, you can't, you know, that's law of thermodynamics. Yeah. But um, what if we... What if we pressurized coal during the daytime using solar and then during the nighttime burned it? Uh, right now, the most efficient we can do that would be too inefficient to allow us to do that. But yeah, in theory, we could make synthetic hydrocarbons, we could make synthetic coal, we could make hydrogen. Yeah, we could make some other alternative power source to be used as the load balance during like you're saying, yeah. downtimes. That, that's actually a model that has been proposed. Somebody actually built a prototype of that. They built a, a hydrogen, uh, excuse me, a hydrogen solar steam reactor. It's a tri-reactor. I think they spent dang near close to a million to two million dollars on it. They figure it could be mass produced for about half a million to, 70, to 750,000. And what it is, is, you know, it's the same fuel cell you have in, um, you, you'd put in a car. Uh, it's, you know, platinum hydrogen fuel cell that makes hydrogen. Uh, it's also using electrolysis and solar to make hydrogen and generate electricity. Basically, it uses, if it has excess power, it uses it to create steam and hydrogen through electrolysis. And course that's going to create heat so that'll create some steam up waste and it basically tries to use these three power sources as efficient as possible to balance the load when the sun starts to dip the hydrogen system kicks on and and, and so on and so forth it we have a technology to do that it's very expensive electricity uh, and why that could definitely build, be built into many things, the primary problem with a hydrogen system is you need platinum, which is probably the rarest, one of the rarest metals on Earth. Like we, I, I, think our, I think our estimation of the total platinum we have on the planet is a cube. I, I want to say 25 meters cube, you know, 25 by 25 by 25. That's, that's how much platinum we think we have in total on the planet. That's the, which is not a lot. <laughs> yeah. So if everybody needs a fuel cell that needs a few ounces of platinum, uh, I'm not sure we have enough platinum. 
We need to go find that asteroid in our solar system that's made of pure platinum and bring it back here. <laughs> yeah, actually, the idea of mining asteroids is pretty interesting. Uh, as far as burning pollution and causing stuff, I remember reading that there are certain ways to capture that pollution and break it down using bacteria and never release it into the atmosphere. I, in, in fact, um, this is one of the reasons I hate the fact that coal has gotten such a bad rap in this country because it, it, it's criminal the way we waste our coal. We burn it and we let all this byproduct go out. If you capture the waste byproducts of a coal plant, you can use the particulates for fertilizing the soil. They actually, because they, they're, they're uh, the uh, nitrogen compounds and particulate compounds properly mixed with bacteria and other things they're saying, they're great for making rich soil. Uh, and the waste CO2 put through the chemistry process of the reverse gas process is actually great for making synthetic octane and dectane, which is gasoline and diesel. So uh, we could literally run this country without any modification to our system if we just stopped wasting our coal and started capturing all the waste byproducts. That used to be the way, that, that was the green movement way, way, way back in the day. Because uh, gasoline was actually a waste byproduct of making kerosene. You know, well, this, 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 what they did with gasoline when they were making kerosene was they got this waste byproduct of gasoline and they just burned it. This is what they did. They just burned it off. They didn't do anything with it. They didn't stick it in cars. They said, like, we got to get rid of this crap. It's in our way. So they just burned it off. Uh, and I, personally, I think regardless of whether you believe in the CO2 thing or not, we should use as close to 100% of the resources as possible. Hello. Can you hear me now? <laughs> oh, no. I can hear you. Can you hear me? He's gone. I'm not gone. Did my lose my internet? I can hear you. I can hear they. Okay, I can hear you. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Damn you, Skype! Can you hear me now? Uh-huh. Okay, then. <laughs> All right, good. What was the last thing you heard? <laughs> uh, talking about kerosene burning into gasoline, and regardless of what you think about... Yeah, okay, yeah. basically I finished this thing I was just saying. I just wish, regardless of what energy resource we're using, we would try and use as close... Uh, our, our problem is that... Um, we focus on there's a waste byproduct, therefore it's bad. I look at that as an engineering problem. If there's a waste byproduct, let's figure out how to do something useful with it. It's like it's only a waste byproduct because we're not doing anything with it right now. <laughs> let's do something with it. So, with a renewable fuel source, I, uh, ethanol, for example, causes is actually more polluting, I think, than uh, gasoline. It, 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 yeah, it actually is, if you do the math. This is one of the things, uh, and this is actually based on the EPA's own numbers. If, um, if you look at the amount of work per volume versus the pollutants per volume ratio, you get out of ethanol versus pure gasoline, uh, versus uh, an ethanol gasoline mix. You know, the more ethanol they mix into our gasoline, the more pollutant it gets. 
because yeah. it's doing less work for the for the same or greater pollutants. Which I'm like, okay, so our plan to save us from these evil planet-killing pollutants is to put more of them out there. <laughs> but my point <laughs> is, well, first of all, is there any way that a car could run without letting out exhaust uh, into uh, the air? Could a car capture exhaust? In any way? Um. Yes, however, you would require a complete redesign of how the car works because the car, uh, the way we've designed the current internal combustion engine is that's also one of its primary ways of getting rid of heat. So you would need to design an alternative heat dissipation system. You basically have to create a, a split level in the exhaust manifold system and you could not run it like that indefinitely you would have to dump that. Yeah, no, that would you, be you, true. You'd have a dump have tank you'd have to dump. But uh, then possibly that could be turned into fertilizer or something useful. Yeah, I, I, I would actually love that system if we redesigned our exhaust system to capture and that resource. And when you go when you go to the gas... Yeah, yeah, when you go to the gas station to fill up, you know, you put one one for putting new fuel in and another hose for emptying the waste tank yeah. out. Yeah. And uh, then the gas stations could make a little bit of extra money from, you know, doing that. Well, you still have to transport all of that around. I'm not sure it, it provide any economic incentive. As a matter of fact, it probably make the whole system more expensive to run, but it would be making further use of that energy resource. And it would stop it from going into the air. So what I'm saying is that we could use ethanol or anything like that, which is very renewable. Uh, uh, no, no, be careful there. Don't, don't imply things that aren't necessarily true. Ethanol what? is renewable, but we don't... Okay, at the way we make ethanol right now, how much farmland are you going to allocate per human being? <laughs> well, how? Well, you know, you could allocate a lot of farms since they don't necessarily have to be completely flat. You, you if you allocated 100% of the surface area of the United States of America towards ethanol production with our current level of efficiency, you would not be able to sustain the automotive needs of the United States of America, then alone our energy needs. Hmm, that's interesting. Algae is the best bet, but it, 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 we still don't have that process worked out. The way we produce ethanol now is from sugar or corn. We don't have enough land in the country. <laughs> stuff and uh, as far as I know ethanol doesn't have to be good tasting so we could put all no the no food. but you, you I mean and you could make ethanol from the corn husks instead of the corn itself however it's an even more inefficient process there are people who are working on that they're, they're, they they have their chemistry lab set on trying to figure out how to make ethanol efficiently from grass clippings, corn husks, all the stuff that's really inefficient as all heck. They're trying to genetically engineer bacteria to help the process, but they have not found success yet. It, 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 basically, the whole problem with this ethanol thing is, it'll work when we have this magical missing piece. I'm like, okay, present me with that magical missing piece, and I'm all ears, but we need that piece first. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. What else do we have? What about nuclear? Um, uh, ironically, the French are doing it much better than us. <laughs> yes, they are. Because uh, uh, um, nuclear has the exact same problem we were talking about with our fossil fuel thing. Uh, it, has, it has two problems, actually. Uh, problem one, we currently do fission because we have not mastered fusion and the problem with the fission reactor is you can't really turn it off at any time you want 
which means you kind of have to be ready for acts of sod, uh, uh, which, you know, that's one of the things why nuclear is getting such a bad rap right now, because uh, what happened in Japan, but alternatively, you have the wastewater, uh, which we don't really do anything with. Um, we don't have a long-term storage facility for that. Uh, it is radioactive for a long time. It is dangerous for a long time. We can't really let it seep into the ground level. Uh, I would love nuclear if we were efficient about how we used it and we did something with the waste byproduct of a nuclear plant. I would love... Uh, now, the concern is we don't want to carry this stuff across the country. Okay, fine. Put a recycler refiner on site at the nuclear plant. If you listen to our government, it's like, oh, well, we can't do that because that's that could potentially create a security risk for weapons grade stuff. It's much better to just sit it there in a pool and let it stockpile forever and ever and ever. <laughs> so. I've also nuclear is not exactly um, renewable, as I've heard. Uh, as far as using uranium for it. Well, you, you, you don't have to use uranium to make nuclear fuel. You can actually make a really great nuclear fuel out of nitrogen, of all things. That has a very short half-life. It, it, it has far less... I, I want to say nitrogen. I, I'm going to have to look at my periodic table. I, I, I swear it's nitrogen, but don't quote me on that. But it's one of the lower elements. You can, you can create an isotope out of it which makes a, a good nuclear fuel. It's nowhere near the order of magnitude you get out of uranium, yeah. but it has very short half-lives, which means it actually decays a lot quicker, too. So it'll be safe quicker? Yes. The waste would be safer much quicker. So, would, so using that, would nuclear be renewable? And importantly, would it generate enough power like that? Well, okay. Um, nuclear generates a huge amount of power using uranium. Yeah, it's, you know... Right it, 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 well, it's, you know, it's that little equation. <laughs> That's in theory. Yeah. You could have 100% energy. Uh, of, uh, uh, we, we are never going to get that, but in theory. Uh, well, as far as renewable, the primary reason we use uranium is because uranium is naturally existing in a state which is conducive to nuclear fission. Uh, with with the, the smallest amount of refinement it's good nuclear fuel. If we made our nuclear fuel out of other things, we're, we're creating artificial states, which means no. It, it, we're going to need something to create that fuel. Um, in theory, it could be uh, a beneficial process, but uh, being purely renewable, no, thermal dynamics gets in the way. Well, why couldn't you create the fuel for it that generates enough to create the fuel because I don't really see that as violating the rules since all you're doing is changing uh, it, 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 Yeah, if you were running the facility that was doing that on um, some other power plant or something, yeah. You, 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 like I said, properly engineered, you could make that sustainable. It's like it, it, renewable and sustainable are different things. Like Because like I said, it doesn't occur in nature, you're creating something that doesn't occur in nature by nature, it's not renewable, but That's you true. could so make it sustainable. Not renewable. Hello. I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, so that's true. Yeah, I mean, that's there's, I mean, hydrogen that we want to tap out of the moon. That's renewable because nature creates it. Fossil fuels are renewable because nature creates them, but they're not sustainable because of the rate at which they're renewed. That, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the little catch we play here in this particular politicized issue. We're like, it's renewable. Oil's renewable. <laughs> Your point? Is it sustainable? <laughs> All right, well, I think we've turned this a little bit into an uh, energy kind of talk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 
uh, on that, if anybody in the, I'm sure we've pissed some people off because people are very in love with their energy sources. So it's like, I, I, if y'all want to have a conversation in the thread below, I, I'd love y'all to and, and try and hammer this out because there isn't, I mean, there, this is a problem human beings need to solve. Our, <laughs> our, our society is going to come to a screeching halt. <laughs> we. Uh, <laughs> You know, setting aside the environmental, the political, and all the other bullshit, we're dependent on having energy. And we need to figure out a way to make, to meet our energy needs in a sustainable manner. Because we can only strip mine so many things for so long. I have a feeling we're going to start strip mining the solar system before we figure that out. But we can only travel so far as human beings at this point. So even if we strip mine the moon and the moon, and the and the moons of Jupiter and, and so on and, and do all this stuff, eventually we're going to use that up too. <laughs> so well, I once read in a book uh, by Michio Kaku that a lot of how far a civilization is is based on how much energy it uses from the sun. Uh, so ideally. We would want to gain as gain as much energy from the sun directly as possible, which means you know, so solar power isn't as efficient as we'd like on Earth, but on in space, uh, theoretically, it's very, very, very powerful. When you have nothing in front of it, it's just directly catching the sunlight like a satellite. I, I, I actually, that's one of the few forms of solar power I actually like because yeah. it's the only form of solar power that you can do a load balance on. You're talking about you put a satellite in orbit that has that 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 tracks and follows the sun. You put an array of them up there, basically, where they're always producing the same amount of power because they're yeah. working in an array to track the sun, and they're firing. It, it takes that energy from the sun, turns it into microwave microwaves, which they relay yeah. throughout the network, and you send those microwaves down to a collection center on the ground at a constant yeah. rate, at a constant time, at all times. And that is technology that we have 100%, every piece of it, we would need to build that today. It needs no new technology. You basically, just have to create a no-fly zone so you're not microwaving anybody who flies through the beam. That, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the only thing that would interfere with that would be the clouds. Yeah, well, the birds would basically get microwaved if they were stupid enough to fly through it. Uh, so we would kill a lot of birds until they learn to go around. <laughs> and the other thing that would get in the way, so you'd need multiple streams, would be cloud cover. So you'd need them working in an array where you're coming from multiple directions where the system knows, oh, I got 50% cloud interception here, so I need to pick up that load from this direction. So instead, of, the models we show is the beam coming straight down, but they would actually be going at like, weird angles like your signal from your direct TV or something and you'd want an array of them where it's more than one signal so if cloud cover is interfering with this trajectory this trajectory over here can pick up okay yeah so that that's something that I was thinking about when we first started talking about that and that's something that I am interested in uh, but obviously what's stopping us is certainly the cost of sending uh, that, the that is a multi-trillion dollar power grid <laughs> which is what I'm saying like it would probably be uh, very renewable and it would be as I understand going through no atmosphere at all makes sunlight very very strong source of energy uh, since I mean that's where all the energy all the other energy on earth comes from anyway it's just sunlight some way or the other like oil well the, just that and the planet's core the, the, the two primary sources of power on earth are the sun and the planet's core yeah and, and plants are just trying to store sun energy naturally yeah uh, now the the one the two downs the two problems the, the, actually there's three primary problems with this grid we're proposing one is the cost yeah two uh, regional jurisdiction because for this grid to work properly, it's really got to be a planet-wide grid. Because you have to have stations on both sides of the planet. Right. So it's, it, it, uh, and you know, 
That's one of the things we still get very iffy about on planet. Why do you have a satellite over my country? Because yeah, I need it I there? <laughs> you no, know, but, but really, you know, there's a reason for that. If you look at these, these could be majorly used as acts of war. Oh, very easily, yes. Yeah. Uh, you have this thing over my country that can that can uh, microwave my country. I don't think so. <laughs> you can shoot it at a military base and you can, like, majorly damage a bunch of shoulder, shoulders. Oh, no, 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 no. You, you, you misunderstand the order of magnitude. This would be a weapons-grade microwave beam. You, you could literally, like, microwave a tank with these if you wanted to. This is not a. This is not like your microwave oven. This is. Uh, I mean, you could do it like that, but that would up the cost of the array. Ideally, you'd want high intensity microwave beams because you want to Anyways, penetrate. That's a problem. That, like, I would. I guess the problem with that is you would need either one world power or world peace in order to really do this and get all the countries to agree. Yeah, it, it, it's. The <laughs> I, 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 I mean, ideally, they're not being used as a weapon, and they're being used in a way that is largely benign and wouldn't be microwaving a tank, but they would definitely have the capability of doing that if somebody chose to use them that way. Yeah, which is a problem. I mean, <laughs> it, it's like, it's... The problem with this is that you can't really attack the country to get the weapon out. They're still going to have the weapon no matter, you know, what you do, unless you start getting... You know, well, and then you have the concerns of honestly whether you trust the countries involved or not. Do you trust of the like idea of a, an outside party like a hacker gaining control of the network and just yeah. having fun with it? Having control of satellites before. Yeah, I, I mean, you you can't guarantee absolute security of a system like that. So that that's problem two. Problem three is our sun is temperamental. Which would yes. mean, you know, every so often it would fry part of this network. So it would be a continued ongoing project for as long as there are humans to keep this network going. And, you know, we have high solar activity and really bad sun flares that would result in diminished power capability. Depending on how fried the satellites get, it may take power out for areas and they'd have to switch over to alternative means until a new satellite can be moved into spit and to, to pick up the load temporarily. Ideally, you'd design the network with enough redundancy that if this part gets fried, you can redistribute the network to pick up the slack. How much time do we have to talk about the rest of this stuff now? Uh, I, I, I'm kind of open this afternoon, so if you want, we can, I, we can put a placeholder here and leave this off in this, and then move into the rest if you want. Sure. Okay. Is this it?